All right, guys, welcome to lesson eight of unit seven. We're talking about cross section volumes again, uh, part two. Today, we're going to talk about semicircular cross sections. We're going to talk about cross sections that are perpendicular to the y axis. So far, we've been doing everything with the cross sections being perpendicular to the x axis. I'll explain that a little bit more when we get there. Um, next, we have, we're going to be having bases that are circular or elliptical rather than just semicircular. Um, and then also we'll do looking at problems that, where you would have to use a calculator for more complicated regions, right? And so that's our objective for the day. And so let's go ahead. We're going to continue with the same piece of notes that we started last time. We're just going to pick up at example five. Okay, so before we begin, um, let's talk about how to find the area of a semicircle. Now you guys know it's pi r squared over 2. Okay, semicircle is half of a circle, right? So we just take the area of a circle, which is pi r squared divided by 2. But here's going to be the issue here on these problems is that you're going to have a semicircle in mind, but the length that they give us is not going to be the radius, but instead it's going to be the diameter. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite this a little bit. I'm going to rewrite this as pi over 2 times r squared. The same thing. It's written a little bit. Um, and the, the reason I did that is because now I want you guys to understand, since we have the diameter instead of the radius, what we're going to be plugging in here is the diameter cut in half. Now I can simplify this. Pi over 2 times d squared. And if I do t squared or 2 squared here on the bottom, I end up with 4. And then when I put these together, I end up with pi over 8. So all I've done is I've rewritten the way to find the area of a semicircle. Instead of doing pi r squared over 2, another way of doing it is pi over 8 times the diameter squared. And I just did that by replacing r with d over 2 and simplifying it. The reason I did that is because on our problems that we're doing today, the base of our, our volume that we're working with is always like the distance from here to here, right? But when I lay this thing down, the distance from here to here, which I'm going to highlight in green, that's going to be the base of our semicircle. And the problem with that is, is that's not a radius of this semicircle that I'm stacking on top of that, right? That is a diameter. And so we need an area formula that has a diameter in it. And that's why. So that's the idea there. So this is the formula that we're going to use because the base of our volume is a diameter. It's not a radius. So we're going to use this formula for the area of a semicircle instead of this formula, which, are, which we're a little bit more familiar with. All right. So Let's go ahead and we'll begin here. Um, the base of a solid region is closed by this semicircle. Now, I, I want you guys, to, I don't want you guys to get too confused here. Um, we're going to be talking about two different semicircles. This semicircle is the one that makes the base of our shape. But the semicircles that we're stacking on top of this are another set of semicircles. Okay, so that's a different thing. We have two different semicircles going on. We have the base, which is a semicircle, but we're also stacking semicircles on top of this base. Now, I'll draw a picture for you guys so you can kind of get kind of a view of what that might look like. But the base of the region enclosed by this semicircle, 9 minus x squared, and the x-axis. So the distance from here to here is just the y value of this function. And the y value, as you can see, is equal to this. So my base is that. Now, as I mentioned to you before, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and make this thing three-dimensional. So I'm going to take this picture and I'm going to lie it flat. So it looks something like this now. And as you guys can see, this, this green vertical line that I traced out earlier, which was right about here, that's going to be like the base of a semicircle that I'm stacking on top of it, just like that. 
coming up in a three-dimensional way. And that base, that y value, is going to be the diameter of the semicircle that I'm stacking on top. So since we're doing the area of a semicircle, and we want the one that involves the diameter, I'm going to go ahead and use this formula right here. In this case, the diameter of this green semicircle that I'm stacking on top here, the diameter of that green semicircle is equal to this length right here, which I call the base. So it's pi over 8 base squared. And my base is, as you guys know, the base is just that little formula up there. It's the square root of 9 minus x squared. There you go. So that's the area of one of my little semicircles. And now, as you guys know, we want to put a bunch of little semicircles on here so that we can get a, a volume a shape created there. And we get that by integrating from point A to point B, which is negative three to positive three, with this formula right here. So actually, just to kind of keep things simple, Semicircles, like the equilateral triangles, are really just the same thing as doing squares. You just square the base, but with a slight difference. Uh, with a semicircle, you have to put a pi over 8 in front of it. And as you guys might recall from the last lesson, doing equilateral triangles is the same thing. It's just that instead of a pi over 8, you put a radical 3 over 4 in front of it. Okay, And then with squares, you don't put anything in front of it. The one that's really different is the rectangles, and we talked about that last time. But anyway, from here on out, it's a calculator question, so I'll go ahead and type it in. You guys can practice calculating this on your calculator. But once again, just like I told you guys last time, um, I, would, I would call the base the y1. And then what I would do is I would type this back on my home screen. When you do this fraction here, you're going to want that in parentheses. And then you're going to want to put y1 in parentheses as well. And you should be able to get your answer, which is, I'm getting 14.137 cubic feet. All right. So, of course, you guys know what's up now. It's your turn to try. This is a homework problem. So go to your homework worksheet. And I'd like you guys to do your number five. I don't think that's the one I wanted. That is not the one I wanted. All right, so here's the right one you can do. Number one on your homework worksheet. Once again, make sure you do this on the homework and not on the notes. Go ahead and pause the video here, and when you're all done, uh, we'll show you what I got. All right, so here is the solution. Um, how'd you guys do with your base? The base was a little bit different, right? We're finding the distance between these two lines here. And when you're trying to find the distance between two curves, you have to subtract the top one from the bottom one. So that's y1 minus y2. And just in case you make a mistake and get it backwards, you can use absolute value bars. So your base in this case was a little bit different. It was a region between two curves. So you have to subtract your function. Also, we have our limits of negative one and positive one, and ultimately get 0.419. And I don't know about you guys, but I forget quite frequently to square it. So be careful about that. You're squaring your base. Um, so be aware of that. All right, go ahead and move back into our notes here, and we'll hit up number six. Now, we're going to be doing something that we haven't done yet. There's a key difference here, and I haven't really been paying attention to it too much until now, but this part right here. Notice that it says the cross sections are perpendicular to the y-axis. Now that's different. Every other problem that we've been doing so far, number five, they've been perpendicular to the x-axis. 
or four, perpendicular to the x-axis. Into three, perpendicular to the x-axis. What, what that means when I say it's perpendicular to the x-axis is that when you have your shape here and then you stack the cross-section on top of it, the base of that cross-section down here is perpendicular, which means it makes a 90-degree angle, which on this shape would look like this. It makes a 90-degree angle with the x-axis. But it is possible that instead of drawing stacking a shape on it that way, so that your base is perpendicular to the x-axis, you could stack a shape on it this way so that it's perpendicular to the y-axis. So I could stack like a square on here. And that would be perpendicular to the y-axis. So now we're looking at this distance here between these two sides of the function. Okay, that's different. Okay, so whenever it says you are doing it perpendicular to the x-axis, we just do it the way we've been doing it. But whenever you get to a problem where they're doing it perpendicular to the y-axis, it's a little bit of a game changer. Okay. So I'm going to write some notes out here for you to write down. So here's what I would encourage you guys to write down in your notes, and I would highlight this section up here as well. When it says that the cross sections are perpendicular to the y-axis, that means the shapes that we're going to be stacking on top of this are, are going to be perpendicular to the y-axis. And what that means is the base is no longer the distance this way from one curve to another, but instead the base is the distance from the left side to the right side. And when we're doing that, that means we're integrating vertically. And when you're integrating vertically, that means you're integrating with respect to y. So there's a couple of things that you have to do. First of all, you're going to make sure that your functions are written in terms of y instead of x. Like up here, I have uh, y equals x squared over 9. But I don't want that. If I'm integrating with respect to y, then I need to get the x by itself instead. So I'll show you how to do that. Second of all, we'll be in, since we're integrating with respect to y, our integral is going to have a dy in there. And instead of going from x equals negative 3 to x equals positive 3, we're actually going to be integrating from x, I'm sorry, y equals 0 to y equals 1 because we're integrating from bottom to top. So there is a little bit of a difference there, right? So two steps of difference here between what we're used to doing. First of all, we need to rewrite our function in terms of y instead of x. And two, we need, we're integrating with respect to y, so we're going from bottom to top. And also, we'll have a dy instead of a dx in our integral. So let's go ahead and uh, do this particular problem. Now, this one, we're going to leave this one alone for now. You can't really do anything with that one. But with this one, we need to solve for x instead. You can't solve for x on this one because there is no x. But this guy here, we can solve for x. Um, now, if we were integrating this with respect to x, by the way, <clears throat> um, then this would be like the difference between y equals 1 and x squared over 9, right? That, that would be the base, the difference between those things. But we're not doing that. Instead, we're going from left to right. And so this y equals 1 actually is just there to tell us where to stop. It's not like we're not finding the area between this curve and this curve necessarily. That's just telling us where to stop. Let me show you what I mean here. So let's go ahead and begin with this function here. I want to get x by itself. So what would I do to get x by itself? Well, the first thing I would do is I would multiply both sides by 9. And if I did that, I would get this, right? The next thing I would do is I'd take a square root. But you've got to remember something kind of special here. When you solve an equation by taking a square root, you always get a plus and a minus. And you have to remember another thing. We talked about this when we talked about circles a little bit. That means we've got two halves. I've got a positive half, and I've got a negative half. Do you guys remember which half is which when you're integrating with respect to y? The positive half is the half that is on the right side. The negative half is the half that's on the left side. So what I've really got here is two functions. Now I'm trying to find the distance between the, the pink function and the green function. I'm trying to find the distance between negative 
radical 9y and positive radical right 9y. And if I want to find the distance between those, I would have to subtract them. We always do right minus left, right? So we do right minus left. In this case, my right function is the green one. That's the positive square root of 9y. And my left one is the negative square root of 9y. And you'll notice that, once again, we have double negatives here in the middle, so that just becomes a plus, right? And if you do 9 radical 9y plus radical 9y, isn't that just 2 radical 9y? So then the distance between the pink and the green is given by this. Okay, so the very first thing you have to do whenever you are doing cross sections that are perpendicular to the y-axis is you have to rewrite the function they give you in terms of y. That means solve for x. Don't forget, a positive means the right side and a negative means the left side. And since we're going perpendicular to the y-axis, meaning this is a 90 degree angle here, this base is perpendicular to the y-axis, since we're going from left to right, then to find the length of this base, we do right minus left. Instead of top minus bottom, we do right minus left. And that's radical 9y minus a negative radical 9y, which puts together to make 2 radical 9y. So there's our base is what that is. So let's go ahead and label that right now as our base. Now, once you've got your base figured out, this is the hardest stuff right here. This is the, the weirdest and newest part of this problem. So make sure you got this. Step one, when you see it says cross sections perpendicular to the y-axis, you need to make sure that it's x equals and not y equals. Now, sometimes they'll just give it to you that way. Sometimes it'll already be an x equals equation. But if it's not, you need to solve for x to get it that way. So step one, when you're doing cross sections perpendicular to the y-axis, solve for x and do right minus left as opposed to top minus bottom. And that will be your base. So if you guys have got that, then you're ready for the rest of it. And the rest of it's not that bad. So here's how the rest of it works. We're integrating with respect to y, right? And we already know, well, actually, let me, um, let me back up a little bit. I'm skipping a step. So number step one is my base. We've already figured out that my base is 2 radical 9y. All right, now the next thing. This time, we also want to pay attention to the fact of what kind of shape are we stacking on top of it. I want to stack rectangles with twice with a height that's twice that of the base. So I'm going to sketch this picture for you guys just so you guys can kind of see what's going on. I'm going to flatten the picture out, right? And it's going to look something like that and that there's my picture right and my bases as i've said before are going horizontally right that's the base of my rectangle so there's my rectangle they want the height to be twice as big so i'm going to make that twice as long as that that doesn't look quite twice as good, higher maybe like that there. there we go that's the rectangle i'm stacking on there so this base, which is 2 radical 9y, we can find the height because the height is supposed to be twice as much. So if I take 2 radical 9y and I multiply that by 2, I get 4 radical 9y. Okay, so you're going to double your base and you get 4 radical 9y. So as you guys know, the area of a rectangle. is given by base times height. And we know our base is 2 radical 9. And then the problem tells us that the height is twice as much as the base. So that's 4 radical 9y. And so if we put these together, we end up with 8 radical 9y squared.
it's 8 because 2 times 4 is 8. And then radical 9y times radical 9y is a radical 9y squared. And there's my base. So now we're ready for step 3, which is to integrate. And you got to remember we're doing this with respect to y. So this is my integrand. The area formula goes here. Area of my rectangles. And now we got to figure out what our limits are. Well, remember, since we're integrating with respect to y this time, my limits are not the left and the right endpoints, but rather it's the bottom and top endpoint. So it's 0 to 1 will be my integration. Now, when we punch this into our calculator, um, you can't do integration with respect to y in your calculator, but it doesn't matter. Just use x. You'll get the same answer. Okay, so just go ahead and type it in as though it were all X's instead of Y's, but you'll get the same answer here. So if you type that in, let's see what we get. And I'm getting 36. All right. So I keep saying this again and again, but I, I, I want to make sure you guys got it because I think this one's probably one of the more tricky ones that we've done yet in this lesson. So step one, solve for X. Step And part of step one is to do right minus left to create your base. Step two, after you've found your base, find your area formula. Step three, integrate your area formula from bottom to top since we're integrating with respect to y. All right. So let's have you guys try one of these. You guys are going to do number two on your homework. Um, once again, do this on your homework sheet, not on your notes. And pause the video here, and when you unpause it, you will see the solution. So, once again, we're noticing that these cross sections are perpendicular to the y axis. So, my base is going to be the distance between the left and the right half. And my first step is going to be to solve for x. So, step one to get rid of the square root, I square both sides. So, now I've got y squared equals 9 minus x squared. Step two, Subtract the 9 on both sides. Step 3, get rid of this negative in front of the x, which changes both of these signs, so I just reversed them like that. And step 4, go ahead and take a square root, and when you do that, you get a positive and a negative. And remember, a positive, when you're in terms of y, is the right side of your graph, and a negative, when you're in terms of y, is the left side of your graph, and so the length of my base is going to be the distance between those two pieces. So the base is going to be right minus left, so green minus pink, or positive minus negative, right? Double negative become positive, and you're just adding this radical to itself, and so you end up with 2 radical 9 minus y squared, and that's my base. That's the end of step 1. Now I'll show you the remainder of the steps. All right, so since our cross sections are going to be semicircles, in other words, I'm stacking semicircles on top of this semicircle, so if we're going to use the formula for the area of a semicircle, in which case we're going to replace the base with what we just got in step one. And so we can also visualize this as a 3D image now. We have the base, and then I'm stacking on top of it semicircles, like so. All right, moving on to step three. All right, and we're going from negative three to positive three, and it's with respect to y, and we're integrating. And if you go ahead and work that out appropriately, you would end up with an answer of about 28.274 would be your final answer there. All right, let's move on to yet another problem now. So from here on out, guys, you're going to have a wild card that you need to deal with. You always need to start by asking yourself, are we doing this perpendicular to x or y axis? Now, for me, I'm doing it perpendicular to the y axis. So I need to start by getting the x by itself. Now, when I give you guys your practice problem that goes with this one, yours is going to be perpendicular to the x axis. So instead, you're going to want to get the y by itself, okay? So when it's perpendicular to the x-axis, you're getting the y by itself. But when it's perpendicular to the y-axis, then you get the x by itself. So 
you have to pay attention to that little subtle detail from here on out. It's up to you to pay attention to that. But that is the first thing that you're going to look at is you're going to ask yourself, okay, what axis is it perpendicular? What, what axis are the cross section perpendicular to? In this case, my base, my, my, uh, sh my cross sections are going to be perpendicular to the y axis, which means that I'm looking for a horizontal distance. And when that happens, we need to get the x by itself. So for me, I'm going to start by getting x by itself. Now, the only reason why I'm doing this example really is just because the base is actually a full circle now or a full ellipse. So that's basically it, though. There's really nothing else special about it. So the first thing I would do is I would subtract this on both sides, and that would give me the following. And then I would multiply everything by 4 so that these cancel out. And that leaves me with x squared here, 4 here, and then these reduce. So we'll be left with y squared over 4. And then, of course, we're going to take the square root on both sides. And when you do that, you're left with x equals plus and minus the square root of 4 minus y squared over 4. Now, for my problem, since I'm doing these things um, perpendicular to the y-axis and I'm getting the x by itself, a positive means we're looking at the right side and a negative means that we're looking at the left side. But when you guys do yours, you're going to be getting the y by itself. And when you do that, a positive means top and a negative means bottom. So you're going to be splitting your shape up a little bit differently than mine. Okay. But anyway, we're still on step one here. So now that I've rewritten it as two functions, the green one and the pink one, I need to find my base length. And my base is basically going to be the right minus the left. Now the right half is the green one, which is the positive one. minus the left half, which is the pink half, and that's the negative one. And the same thing keeps happening here, so you guys might be noticing a shortcut, and feel free to use it. But in this case, I've got double negatives here, so those are adding, and then you put them together and it just becomes this. So you might be wondering, Mr. Bailey, what's this shortcut? Well, if you can't figure it out, you shouldn't use it. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel about a lot of shortcuts. All right, so there it is. But that's my base. So the base is the distance between the left half and the right half because we are going perpendicular to the y-axis. And the distance between them is represented by this. So that's the end of step one, finding the length of your base. Now, once again, I'll reiterate, on your student practice, you are going to be getting the y by itself instead of the x. And when you do that, instead of breaking it up into left minus right, you'll be breaking it up into top minus bottom. And the reason yours is different is because on your student practice, you're going perpendicular to the x-axis, which means you're going from top to bottom instead. All right. But that's enough jibber-jabber about step one. Let's move on to step two. Step two, we need to pay attention to what kind of a shape are we stacking on top of this? You know, so I'm going to take this oval here and I'm going to lay it flat like so. And I know that we're going to be laying a shape this way. That's not drawn very nicely. This way on top of that oval. What kind of a shape am I drawing on top of here, though? Well, they're rectangles and their heights are half the base. So in this case, my base is this green line down here. And it's a good, I'm going to draw, a, I'm going to stack a rectangle right on top of it, like so. And this height should be half as much as this base. Now, how do you find the area of a rectangle? Well, hopefully you guys know the area of a rectangle is base times height, right? Now the base is the length of the green line 
which we found in step one. The base is 2 square root of 4 minus y squared over 4. The height, according to the directions up here, the, the height is half of that. So what's half of this? Well, if you take half of this, you're just going to cut the 2 in half, which is 1. And so you end up with just the square root of 4 minus y squared over 4. And we can just simplify this by writing it as 2 parentheses, 4 minus y squared over 4 being squared, because we have two of those things multiplying each other. Okay. So that's the end of step two. Now I want to stack an infinite number of rectangles whose bases are lines perpendicular to the y-axis on top of this ellipse, so that I end up with a some kind of a an odd looking little figure. Might look something like uh Hard to tell what this would look like. It would kind of just look like almost like an eclair or a donut or something, I think. Kind of, with a flat top on it anyway. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on to step three. Step three, we're going to integrate. Now remember, I'm doing this because it's perpendicular to the y-axis. I'm integrating with respect to y. So this is another place where you and I are going to be different. Since I'm integrating with respect to y, because I'm going perpendicular to the y-axis, I'm going from bottom to top. So my limits are negative 4 to 4. But for you, you're going to be going with respect to x. So you're going to go from left to right with your limits instead. So pay attention to those subtle little details. Um, and what goes here, of course, is this little expression for the area that we found here of our rectangle. There we go. Typing that into my calculator, I can get my final answer and my volume of this donut shape with a flat top would be 42.6 bar cubic units. All right. So for you, once again, I'll go over how your student practice is going to be different. Your student practice is going to be with cross sections perpendicular to the x axis. And because of that, you're going to get y by itself. And when you do, and you solve for y, the plus and the minus is going to indicate top and bottom as opposed to left and right. After that, most of it stays pretty much the same until you get to the very end. You have to keep in mind that your limits on your integral are going to be the left and the right endpoints rather than the bottom and the top. And so you're going to have to keep those things in mind. You're always going to have to pay attention to what it's perpendicular to. That's your first step from now on, because that will determine the direction you take with the problem. All right, so let's go ahead and have you guys try one of them. Here's yours. So go ahead and pause the video here. And when you unpause it, I will show you one step at a time. All right, so step one. We notice it's perpendicular. We want cross sections that are perpendicular to the x axis. So my bases are going to go from top to bottom. And when that happens, we want to get the y by itself. So I subtracted x squared on both sides, and then I took a square root. A positive square root means the top half of the circle, a negative square root means the bottom half of the circle. Now, my base, since it's perpendicular to the x axis, is going from top to bottom. So it's top minus bottom instead of right minus left. And the top is the positive green one. And the bottom is the negative pink one. And when you subtract them, the double negative becomes a plus, And you have a radical plus itself, which is just two of those. right? And so there's your base length. That's the length of this line. OK, let's go ahead and move on to step two. So this time around, we're stacking. Um, isosceles right triangles. Now, I haven't done any of my example problems. I believe there was one in the homework last night, though, um, or homework before this one. Um, so an isosceles right triangle is a, is a right triangle, which I've sketched in green here, where the height and the base are the same. 
So the way you find the area of an isosceles right triangle is you just do base times height cut in half. A little bit different than the equilateral triangle, right? So the base is, as we already know, this, because we figured that out in step one. But since it's isosceles, the height is also the same thing. Okay, so we have 2 times 2, which is 4, but it's cut in half, which is 2 again. And then we have 36 minus x squared being multiplied by itself to make a square there. And so this is the area of that isosceles right triangle. So that's the end of step 2. We found the area of the cross section. Now we want to move on to step 3 where we draw a, a few of these triangles on this shape and then connect the dots to see what kind of a weird image we're getting here out of this. All right. And that's the integral you should have set up. Notice this with respect to x because we're going perpendicular to the x-axis. Also, these numbers here, negative 6 and 6, they are the left and the right because we're integrating this way horizontally. Now, um, the issue here is, is that th even if you forgot and you did top, bottom to top, you, you still got negative 6 and 6 because this is a circle. But be careful. Make sure you knew that these numbers here came from the left and the right, not the bottom and the top, because you're doing it with respect to x. But either way, there's your setup, and we'll go ahead and see what the answer is there. You should be about 576. Final answer. And you'll notice their setup's a little bit different than ours, but it's really the same thing. Um, I don't, you don't need to know this, but I'll just, I'll just show you how it's really just the same thing. If you put these together, you get two of them, right? So we'll do that and make that. And if you square the two, then we could take it out of the parentheses and put it out here as a four, right? because 2 squared is 4. And then if you take this half and apply it to the 4, you still get 2 in the front. It's the same exact thing we had. So they're just setting their problem up differently, but it's the same answer. All right, um, let's go ahead and we'll go back to the note. And we have one more example we're going to take a look at today. Um, and this one is going to be done on a graphing calculator. And the only reason why this one's kind of worth spending a little bit of time on is because of the fact that, A, they're not giving us a picture, so we're going to have to have a picture to uh, answer the question. Um, also, another reason why is because we, we don't really know where we're starting and stopping here. It doesn't tell us where the functions are intersecting, so we don't know our starting point and our ending point. And solving it algebraically just by setting them equal to each other kind of seems to be out of the option as well because those are pretty strange looking equations so this is just something we're going to do on the calculator so we're going to graph it we're going to find where they intersect and after that we're home free um, we're just going to be doing exactly the way we've been doing it so let's go ahead and go to our calculator here i've already put the equations in and then we're going to push graph and you can see the graph so if you need to catch up with me type your functions in and then go ahead and push graph and uh, it looks something like that and as you guys can see we're looking at this little region right here we want to find the area enclosed between the curves on this little region so we need to find where they're crossing here and we also need to find where they're crossing here okay so let's go ahead and see if we can find those points so we're going to push how do we find where uh, lines cross? Well, once again, you push uh, second, you push calc, and you push number five for intersect, and you scroll over to where they're crossing, and you just push enter three times, and it gives you the answer. Now, <clears throat> you can write this number down, but remember, we've also talked about how you can store that number on your calculator so that you don't have to use the rounded one. Because even if you write this number down, it's still going to be rounded and therefore not quite right when you plug it back into the calculator to use it a second time. But if you just push enter, store, and then alpha A, now 
our calculator has stored that value for x under the variable a. Let's go back to our graph, and we're going to repeat that process now for the other point of intersection. So we're going to push math. I'm sorry, not math. I do that quite frequently. We're going to push second calc. We're going to push 5. And then we're going to scroll to where they cross again. Which is right over here. And we're going to push enter three times. And it gives us the other intersection point. And once again, instead of writing it down, I'm just going to let my calculator store it. So I'm going to push enter, store, alpha, b. And there you go. So now we're ready to go ahead and find the area between, or not the area, but rather the volume of this shape. Let's go back to our question really quick again and just see what it was that we were being asked to do. Um, on this particular question, we have a graph now that looks something like this. Right? And they're crossing here at A, and they're crossing here at B. Um, and what we want to do is we want to find the volume of a solid that is created when you are stacking squares on top of this shape in such a way that they are perpendicular to the x-axis. That's important because when you're perpendicular to the x-axis, you want your equations to be in terms of x, which they already are. We're good. So we don't have to reverse those equations around. We like them just the way they are. Those are both equations in terms of x. So um, let's go ahead and begin. So how do we do this? Well, step one is to identify your base, right? Your base of these squares, if you're stacking squares on there, perpendicular to the x-axis means we're going to be going vertically, okay, um, is the distance between the top function and the bottom function. Now, you need to know which function's on top and which one's on bottom, or I guess you really don't, right? Because all you really need to do is put the absolute value bars on it. Now, I think on my um, calculator here, I called this one y1 and I called this one y2. Uh, now, I already know that it's the y2 that's on top, and you can tell that by looking at your calculator as well. But once again, if you're not sure, hey, just throw some absolute value bars on there, problem solved. So that's going to be my base, is the distance between those two functions there. Okay. Now we want to find the area of the shapes that we're stacking on top of it. So I'm going to draw my little 3D image here, which is going to look something like this. Okay. And what I'm doing is I'm stacking squares on there that are perpendicular to the x-axis. So that would look something like this. Right? And that if we're doing squares, that means the base is the same as the height, and the area of a square is just base squared. So the area of a square is equal to your base being squared. And therefore, in this case, then, that would mean that y2 minus y1 is being squared. And there's my area. And then finally, if you want to stack an infinite number of these little squares on here, to generate a volume of a shape, then we need to integrate from our starting point to our ending point, which adds together all these little areas. And we're integrating with respect to x here. Okay? And so this is what I'm going to be typing into my calculator. And that's what's going to give me my answer. That's all kind of old news. What's new here is the fact that we had to graph it ourselves. We had to find the points of intersection ourselves. And we got to review how to store values on our calculator. Okay, so let's go back to our calculator and finish up this problem here. So I'm going to push second and quit. I'm going to go to my home screen. And I'm going to go to math. I'm going to push 9 for integral, and I'm going to put alpha a at the bottom because my calculator has the a value stored here, the first intersection point. And then I'm going to put alpha b here because my calculator has the 
B value stored here, which is the second intersection point. And you don't really need the absolute value bars on this one because we're squaring it, and squares also get rid of sign differences. But just so it looks like what we wrote on the board, I'll go ahead and include it. So I'm going to do um, parentheses here, and then I'm going to go to math, scroll over to num, put one for absolute value. We're going to do y1 minus y2, close parentheses and square it. And then we're going to go ahead and put x there. And we're home free. We should have an answer at that point, which is 24.451 cubic units would be the volume of that shape. All right. So now it's your guys' turn to give one of these things a try. I believe we were on number four. So go ahead and pause the video here and uh, see if you can figure out the solution to this problem. When you unpause it, I will show you the solution. And here's what your graph would have looked like. And here's an estimate of those points of intersection, which I've defined A and B. And once again, since we're stacking squares uh, perpendicular to the x-axis, we're, we're doing this with respect to x, and this is the formula for the area of a square. And so, final answer, 1.545. And that'll conclude our lesson 7.8, and we'll see you guys next time.